Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Polar Expeditions from Past to Present. We are so excited to have you joining us. Um, this is a joint event with Series Education and Outreach and Reach the World. Excited to have you joining us. Uh, um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, we would love to hear where you're joining from. So drop in the chat where you're logging in from today. We would love to hear from you this morning. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. So we're, we're, um, we've got series and reach the world. Leanna Nixon is going to join us from series. Uh, this is a special joint live stream event, and we're going to talk about polar expeditions from past to present. We've got four polar expeditions that we're going to talk about, two from the past, which have inspired modern polar expeditions. And uh, it's exciting to talk about the connections between these four and the connections between the work that's happening both in the north and in the south in our polar regions. Um, Timothy Jacob is the director of travel uh, program at Reach the World. Uh, they're a global education nonprofit based in New York City. And we've got Leanna Nixon, who's joining us from Ceres. She's a photojournalist and a documentary filmmaker. Uh, she was on the Mosaic Expedition, and we're really excited to hear from her. Um, and Tim was uh, involved in On the Endurance 22. Is that right, Tim? Correct. So we're really excited to hear from Tim about endurance um, and the journey and the connection between these four. I'm going to pass it off to Leanna and Tim. Awesome. Thanks, Daniela. Thanks yep. for the nice introduction. Hey, Leanna, how are you? Hey, I'm great, Tim. How are you? I am great. This is so exciting to be able to connect with you during our Earth Week and to talk about some of the really cool science that polar expeditions do and some of the historic expeditions that have inspired um, these modern expeditions that you and I were involved in. Yeah, absolutely. There were huge historical connections between um, both of our expeditions with Mosaic and the Endurance 22. I'm excited to talk about them. Excellent. If we can um, get our slide deck up, we will dive right into it. Um, and I am going to move my cat out of the way, one of those things <laughs> that happens. Um, all right. So um, like Daniela said, my name is Tim. Um, I was recently returned from the Endurance 22 expedition which was a really amazing expedition to the Ant Antarctic region and the Weddell Sea in search of Sir Ernest Shackleton's sunken ship Endurance. And as part of that expedition, um, we did uh, quite a bit of science. I didn't personally do the science. I helped with the science and I learned a lot from the scientists and I'm excited to talk about that today. Uh, Leanne, do you wanna give a quick intro to uh, you and your involvement? Yeah, absolutely. So I am by trade a photojournalist and documentary filmmaker, and I was on board the Mosaic Expedition from May 2020 to October 2020, um, recording what the scientists were doing out in the field and why their work was so important. So as you can see here with the little map of the Arctic here, um, there's actually no land that is like the center of the Arctic, right? It's only, um, there's a couple countries that kind of surround there. So I was in the middle of the Arctic Ocean on a single ice flow, kind of towards Greenland by the time that I got there and just really we're exploring and collecting a lot of scientific observations, um, whether it was the atmosphere, sea ice, ocean, and the life that circulates throughout it. Excellent. I think these maps are really helpful because not many of us look at the earth this way. We look at the earth as you see it on a globe uh, with sort of the countries and you can spin it and it sort of focuses on the middle of the earth or the equator region. Um, but when you tip the, a globe on its, on its end, uh, you get a really interesting view of what the Arctic looks like, what the continent of Antarctica looks like. Um, and for the purposes of what I'm going to be talking about, you can see just at the top of this, this um, map of the Antarctic continent, a uh, nice little crescent-shaped bay. I would, shouldn't call it little, it's quite large, um, <laughs> just to the east of the Antarctic Peninsula. And that is the Weddell Sea. It's a very unique place that is covered in some part by sea ice year-round. Um, so it is, again, this expedition is another uh, expedition where we were 
over over water, not necessarily over the land that there is in the Antarctic. And Leanne and I will compare and contrast the Arctic and Antarctic and what they have in common and what they have different in just a moment. Awesome. All right, that's, there we go. All right, so we want to start by talking about some of the historical expeditions that inspired the modern day expeditions that we went on. Um, if you're looking at it in terms of a timeline, uh, uh, inspirational expedition happened first. Um, so Leanne, do you want to talk about the Fram expedition? Yeah, absolutely. So the Fram ex expedition was led by Norwegian explorer and polar scientist Fridtjof Nansen. And he wanted to basically solidify a theory that he had that there is this transpolar drift, uh, this ocean current that can take you from the Siberian Arctic, so Russia, all the way across to Greenland. So what he decided to do with a crew for about three years is take his ship that he engineered very specifically for sea ice um, and just planted it onto like next to some sea ice and they floated down this current. And the current changed throughout the years that he and his team were going, um, but never quite took them to the North Pole. So um, this was a huge, um, you know, kind of discovery, if you will, uh, just because it helped us really understand the ocean and wind currents that really help guide the Arctic that we're seeing in the past and today. All right, very nice. And for my historical expedition inspiration, um, we at the Endurance 22 expedition took a lot of um, cues and certainly the primary objective of our expedition was directly tied to the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of words that just mean that Sir Ernest Shackleton and his crew were trying to be the first people to travel by land all the way across the continent of Antarctica through the newly sort of reached um, just a few years prior uh, through the South Pole. So it was a really big undertaking. Um, they did have scientists on board, but I would say it was more of a, an exploration based uh, expedition where they were trying to be the first to um, complete this really what would have been an incredible feat by walking overland all the way across the continent of Antarctica. So you can see in this picture, um, the, the crew of the Imperial Transarctic Expedition battling with the Weddell Sea, sea ice. Um, and I, I just think both of these ships are really interesting and beautiful old wooden ships. It gives you a good sense of uh, what it looked like to go on an expedition back in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. So let's go on to the next slide, please. All right, um, Leanne and I did our very best to sort of compare and contrast the differences and similarities between the Arctic and the Antarctic. For those of you who maybe haven't thought much about these two regions or maybe have some misconceptions about what one is or, or one isn't. Um, and I think, Leanne, maybe this was the case for you too. I discovered that they have more in common than I thought for being so far away from each other on our Earth. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of similarities, um, but in these similarities, there can be like big contrastual differences when you get into the nitty gritty science. But yeah, um, the way that the food chain works is very similar on both poles. Um, the ecosystems that they're considered, they're more like deserts rather than, um, uh, you know, other kinds of ecosystems we think about. Um, these are really important things that actually do make them quite similar and how they play a role in our planet. Yeah, we, we wanted to make sure that the defining characteristic that separated them was that in the Arctic, there are polar bears. In the Antarctic, <laughs> there are not polar bears. Uh, in the Antarctic, there are penguins. And in the Arctic, there are not penguins. So uh, if you remember one thing from this slide, remember that for sure. Um, some of the, like Leanna was saying, um, some of the things that they have in common are have a little bit more nuance to them. For example, um, Antarctica, in the Antarctic region is a desert, meaning it gets very little uh, precipitation um, each year, which is kind of surprising to a lot of people. And I think just parts of the Arctic are considered a desert. There are areas that are not considered a desert, but mm -hmm. there are areas of the Arctic that uh, are considered a desert based on how much precipitation they get. There are icebergs in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. 
Um, there's definitely sea ice, which we're going to talk a lot more about today and how cool sea ice is. Um, there are humans um, in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, Leanna, do you want to talk about the humans of the Arctic for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. So the Arctic actually has permanent residents year round, unlike Antarctica. Um, and these residents, there's about 6 million people that live in the Arctic, and the majority of them being indigenous peoples who have been in the Arctic for over millennia. So they're the ones that actually really know the secrets of the Arctic, right? And they have been using sea ice as part of that's the key thing in their way of life that helped them travel, that helps them hunt, that is home for them. All right. And in contrast, even though we have humans in the, the shared category here, the people who live on Antarctica are scientists um, and people who are supporting scientists at the various uh, research bases that you can find throughout Antarctica. So no indigenous communities in Antarctica, all sort of scientists who come and go um, and um, are there for different parts of the year. Um, one of the other things in the combined category that's worth maybe exploring a little more is land. What do we mean by land when it comes to the Arctic? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we have, um, so like I said before, the Arctic is really defined by a big ocean in the center of it. And that's where most of our sea ice um, kind of, you know, is. And there are eight countries that surround it. So when we think about ownership of the Arctic, there are eight physical countries that actually do have ownership of the Arctic. And then, of course, we have um, other individual, like other countries that um, are part of the Arctic Council, so are part of making decisions about the Arctic. But when it really comes to the ocean, it's kind of international waters, right? So they're still kind of trying to figuring out a lot about how we care for the Arctic as a collective global community. All right, awesome. And of course, with the Antarctic, it is an actual continent. There is land, uh, but it's underneath approximately or on average about a mile of, of snow and ice um, throughout the, the Antarctic. So one big difference. All right, let's get into ships. I know a lot of students love mm -hmm. ships and there are four really interesting, cool ships to talk about here. Um, I'll go first for endurance because a ship, the ships were a big part of the historical expedition and the modern expedition that was inspired by it. Um, you can see in the top right corner, uh, a model of the endurance, which was Ernest Shackleton's ship. Um, he, it was built in Norway in 1912, originally um, meant to carry tourists to the Arctic, um, but was bought shortly thereafter um, by Ernest Shackleton because it was built for traveling through dense sea ice conditions. Um, and as a sort of spoiler alert, um, it did not survive the, the Weddell Sea uh, due to the really dynamic and, and interesting ice conditions there. But um, that inspired the Endurance 22 expedition many years later um, that I returned from just over a month ago um, to travel in our own modern icebreaking ship, the S.A. Agolis II, which is featured right below the picture of Endurance, um, which is built, you know, is light years ahead of Endurance in terms of its ability to navigate safely the sea ice of the Weddell Sea and we use the S.A. Agolis II in order to get to the spot where the endurance sank uh, over 107 years ago and conduct an underwater search looking for the wreck of endurance. Awesome. And in the left hand corner here, we can see the Fram. Um, and as I, um, as I kind of said before, Fridtjof Nansen was really specific about how this ship was built. So it's a three-master schooner, which just means it's a really big sailboat with at least two masts, so the giant poles that are sticking out. And he wanted to make sure that um, it could handle ice pressure. And so what they did was that they built a rounded hull and they had it made out of oak, which is a pretty dense wood. And then they put sawdust in between and kind of sealed it so that the sawdust could be crushed as um, sea ice would crush the ship um, and that would cause it not to break so it could withstand that pressure. It was also made to be small and light so that it could withstand ice pressure. And it, another cool fact is that it had a windmill on board to provide electricity. 
Yeah. And electricity wasn't really um, that popular in this time. It was just starting to be used like in factories and all these other things. So it was a really cool um, thing to add in terms of scientific discovery. He also made it really comfy for crew and for sled dogs. They did indeed have sled dogs on board because he knew that it was going to be quite a few years um, that they were going to be on board. Now the Polar Stern is a little bit older than a tin vessel that he was on. It was built in the 80s and it has been going over, um, they're kind of redoing some of it a little bit. But what's really cool about the Polar Stern is that it travels to both the North Pole and the South Pole um, throughout the year. It also has a lot of room for uh, scientific observations and research labs. There's tons of freezers that are deep under there. Um, and they also have a uh, really big, nice kitchen and two dining halls that feed you cake at 3 p.m. every afternoon. Um, so it really was home away from home. It was quite a nice shift to be on. Cool. And one more fun fact about these ships. I, I don't know that the S.A. Gallus II has ever ventured too far into the Arctic, but I do mm -hmm. know that the S.A. Gallus II has been to the, the sink coordinates of Endurance twice, and there are fewer than five ships that have ever been to this very remote place. And one of them that has been there also is the Polish Dern. So yes. they have both been to this area of the Weddell Sea. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so a big part of both of our modern expeditions was polar science. And because it is Earth Week, and we're thinking a lot about the planet and how our scientists um, study and learn about the planet so that we can be better stewards of it. Um, we wanted to focus on polar science in action. Polar science is really cool, and I didn't know actually much about it until I got to live it and volunteer uh, alongside some of the scientists um, who had also been on the Mosaic expedition, mm -hmm. who were on the Endurance 22 expedition. So maybe you want to start with some of the cool science that was happening um, as part of the Mosaic expedition. Yeah, absolutely. And I will kind of circle back to one of our Arctic themes about polar bears here. We couldn't do the science without actually having polar bear guards. So people that would look out on the sea ice for us in case there was a polar bear that was coming because polar bears uh, can be a threat to us and we can also be a threat to them, right? So Mosaic was centralized on um, polar science and we did tons of things on the ice and on the ship in order to um, properly record what we were seeing day to day. Um, so we were doing all these tiny little scientific observations um, from the tiniest little sea ice crystals to using satellite imagery to help us really see what's going on in the Arctic. And we had microbiologists on board, chemists, um, you know, ice physicists, atmospheric scientists, all working together to really just see what's happening in the Arctic. So there, there were a lot of different ways that they were looking at sea ice or the atmosphere ocean. Um, so the one photo up top is of uh, Dr. Ali Fong and Amelia Chamberlain. Uh, they're actually looking at a sea ice core. So something that they drilled out of the sea ice and they're cutting it up into sample sizes to do experiments. Um, Tim and I have the same kind of themed picture of the polkas, uh, these sleds that they would use to uh, drag equipment behind them because it's a lot of work, <laughs> you know, walking through ice and snow and polkas really do help. And when I was out there, um, our ice flow was melting and actually it broke up into pieces eventually. So um, in order to kind of go around melt ponds or, you know, little rivers that were there, we had to build bridges. So we had a lot of like random wooden pallets around <laughs> to help us cross. Um, and we took out like thousands of pounds worth of uh, research instruments out onto the sea ice. So as you can see on the bottom, that is our tallest instrument that we had out there. We call it the Met Tower. It helps us, um, you know, kind of record different attributes about the atmosphere. And it was about um, at least 30 feet tall. So it was really big. We needed a lot of people to put it up there. Um, but yeah, these, uh, all these instruments were out there almost the entire year, really giving us some of the most in-depth observations we've had of the Arctic to date. 
Very cool. I, um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the scientists who are doing the work with Liana and, and the Arctic as part of Mosaic also joined the Endurance 22 expedition. So it struck me for the first time, we might be looking at the same polka or some of the same uh, sleds were used. Um, it's really a, an honor for me to be able to help share the story of the polar scientists who are a part of this expedition because I was so inspired by their work during my time observing them and in some cases helping them, which was really fun. Um, and it helped me understand, first of all, how hard it is to conduct science in polar regions. Um, you're wearing, you know, probably two or three pairs of gloves trying to manipulate small scientific equipment or working, you know, in very windy or, or dark or cold uh, environments. Uh, all in the name of collecting data that will help us better understand these really far off um, regions that not very many people get to go to, mostly because they're so hard to reach. Um, so being down in the Weddell Sea and getting to see uh, the scientists who are a part of the Endurance 22 expedition in action was really fun for me. The Imperial Transarctic Expedition had scientists on board. As I said earlier, the primary objective was exploration and was crossing the Antarctic uh, continent. But there are actually four scientists aboard uh, the Endurance. Uh, and I have my little cheat sheet here. There was Robert Clark, he was a biologist. There was Leonard Hussey, who was a meteorologist. There was James Wordy, who was a geologist and Reginald James, who was a physicist. And they back in 1914, 1915, were really just starting to understand uh, this area of the world that very few people had been to, even fewer than had been to 100 years later when I was there. Um, so it's, it's a stark contrast for fast forward 100 years, 107 years, and we are uh, really like bringing complex scientific equipment down to the ice so that we can measure average sea ice thickness. We can look at the crystal structure of the ice and snow um, on the sea ice of the Weddell Sea. We can use, um, similar to what Leanna was saying, we use remote sensing uh, images from satellites. Um, and since we were actually standing on the ice that the satellites were sending pictures of, we could compare how well the images reflect what was actually happening on the ground. So in the future, we wouldn't necessarily have to go there ourselves to know or judge the state of the sea ice because we can really compare or understand what the satellites are telling us better um, by comparing the two. So. Uh, just real quickly, the, the pictures that I have here, I got a chance to pull um, one of those polkas. Um, you can see in the very, very far distance, the SA Agalas 2 is really fun to walk far away from the ship and help the team that was measuring the, the average ice thickness of this ice flow that we were on. Uh, I got to work with the South African Weather Service that was doing some really interesting meteorological and oceanographic um, data collection, including deploying what I'm holding in this picture, which is a really smart buoy called an Argo float um, that I was in this picture launching in the middle of the night because we were crossing a very specific degree of latitude. And um, those buoys are now gonna float and collect data um, in parts of the ocean that are rarely visited and will help us understand what's happening uh, long after we've left. And then the picture below um, is James John, a scientist from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, um, using some of that remote sensing data to give us a good sense of um, what the um, Arctic or the sea ice conditions uh, we should expect as we got into the sea ice of the Weddell Sea. It was at face value, really helpful for us just getting to the sink site of endurance, um, but also, you know, in the background provides all sorts of really usable data uh, for future polar navigation. Um, there were a, a team on the ship that was studying specifically the impact of the ice in the ocean on the hull of a, a polar vessel so that we can develop stronger and better polar vessels in the future. Um, so much going on from a science perspective as part of this expedition as well. All right, so I think one of the first things I realized very, very soon upon arriving in the Weddell Sea, and maybe you uh, found this too, Liana, when you got to the Arctic, is that the sea ice and studying sea ice is not easy. 
Yeah, it it really is not. Um, you know, the sea ice that you're that the that is pictured here from your trip is actually a lot of really new ice, probably yeah. ice that you wouldn't walk on because you could fall through. Um, but there are a lot of challenges just getting up there. So having a good ship, um, being able to safely walk on it if you're using it. Sometimes satellites don't even go as far as you need to in order to actually record some of that um, ro remote sensing data that you were saying. Um, and so, yeah, I think for <laughs> some of the explorers in the past, like Nansen, you know, he wanted to go to the North Pole. The transpolar drift wasn't taking him there. So he decided to cross-country ski there. Uh, which was really difficult. He failed the first time and had to go up again. Um, and as for Mosaic, we did make it to the North Pole. That was just something that we decided that we wanted to do after our ice flow um, broke. But we were able to do this because the sea ice has been rapidly changing in the Arctic. We're seeing less and less of multi-year sea ice, which is ice that is you know, at least two years or older that stays year round. We're seeing a lot of first year or more seasonal ice up there in the central Arctic. All right. Well, we, for anyone who's familiar with Shackleton and his expedition, we know he had many challenges in exploring this region. He did not really intend to visit the areas of the Weddell Sea that he ended up in. He was sort of caught in this gyre or this circular motion of sea ice of the Weddell Sea and uh, his ship Endurance was frozen uh, in the ice and eventually crushed and, and sank um, much further north than the Weddell Sea. So he had many challenges. Um, he also was sort of um, not under-equipped in a way in terms of polar expedition clothing. I would say we've come a long way uh, in yes. terms of just staying warm uh, and operating on the ice. Um, the, the waterproof and windproof clothing that modern day polar scientists and explorers wear is much better at keeping people dry and, and warm while doing this kind of work. Um, like the polar stern, uh, the SA Gullis II is a modern ice breaking ship that has a, a reinforced hull, uh, all sorts of uh, fancy tricks for not getting caught in ice. Um, it was really, amazing to see the ship when it entered the sea ice and how it navigated, especially under the really amazing leadership of the, the Captain Knowledge Bengu of the ship and the ice navigation team. Um, but even all of that said, it's a very dynamic place. Uh, it was not out of the question that we could have been frozen in the sea ice and not been able to move uh, at certain points when it got very cold. Um, that didn't happen to us, but it was definitely something that we thought about and monitored and worried about to a certain extent because these this Weddell Sea and to a, an extent the Arctic regions uh, Leanne is talking about too are still very challenging to navigate, are still very remote and hard to get to, and um, any data that we can collect through expeditions like these really advance our understanding of, um, of what these environments are telling us and are really useful. So um, yeah, let's go into the next one. All right, sea ice, what's the big deal? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, awesome. Well, sea ice is, you know, because like I said, the Arctic, it, there's no big continent that defines the Arctic, right? It's the sea ice, the sea ice in the middle of the Arctic Ocean here. It's monumentally important because it's uh, it serves as a way of life for um, even the smallest tiny organisms to polar bears, to indigenous communities and their way of life. It serves as um, a monumental part of the uh, local climate system and also for a global climate system. The Arctic serves um, the entire globe as well as the Antarctic as like our world's air conditioner, right? So it helps keeps us cool. And as the sea ice is changing, uh, as some scientists like to call the Arctic that we're seeing today, the new Arctic, um, we're having less sea ice. So we're really trying to understand what's happening, what's going on to see this these rapid changes in the Arctic, the decreasing of sea ice so that we can um, really understand what's going to happen to the Arctic, its future, and also perhaps our global future.
Yeah, that's a really good uh, perspective on that. I knew almost nothing about sea ice mm -hmm. when I went got to the Weddell Sea, and I just kind of glommed on to the sea ice scientists uh, who are part of the expedition and learned so much from them, especially um, Dr. Steffi Arndt, who is also on the Mosaic expedition, and just has this like overwhelming passion for sea ice. Mm -hmm. And at first, I didn't understand it because it's ice and there's lots of it. And she was very effective in, in telling me how sea ice forms, um, why it is so interesting, um, how it can be so di dynamic. When you are frozen in uh, ice flow, like um, the Polar Stern and the SA Gallus were uh, in their respective areas, you really have no sense of how quickly that ice can be moving from day to day. It feels like you're sitting still, um, but there were uh, days during the Endurance 22 expedition where we moved several miles in a day because the ice was moving so much. And it is a really uh, stark reminder to me that these ecosystems that seem like very sort of frozen and still and not much is happening maybe, uh, if you're not a, a polar scientist, are always moving and always changing. Uh, and that was really, really interesting for me to learn more about and to watch. Um, sea ice helped us in our search for the endurance um, because when you have sea ice sort of covering the whole surface of the sea, it tampers down the activity that's happening underneath the, the sea. Even though the Weddell Sea where we found endurance is about 10,000 feet deep, there wasn't a lot of uh, sediment on the bottom of the, of the Weddell Sea that had moved around. You would think maybe after 107 years, um, there, the ship would be covered with a couple inches maybe of, uh, of sand or sediment. Um, and it's, it's all very still. There was a very, just a small amount of sediment um, that that had shifted that deep down underneath the sea. So I learned a lot about sea ice. I have a great appreciation now uh, for sea ice and how important it is. I know that um, the sea ice in Antarctica is not generally changing as much as the sea ice in the Arctic, but the data that was collected um, as part of this expedition and as part of Leanna's expedition really, really helps us better understand what's happening in these places that are certainly changing. Yeah, and, and just to emphasize here with this slide, uh, it we're just showing you how modern science has um, really uh, changed the way that we look at sea ice. We're looking at it at tiny little variations of crystals where um, Amy in the right hand bottom corner, she's digging a snow pit essentially to collect tiny little uh, snow and ice crystals to see what's going on with the surface. Um, we're looking at sea ice from underneath above that image using a remote operating vehicle. People are walking on top of sea ice or melt ponds to understand all these different attributes. Um, even using in the left hand corner, they kind of look like Star Wars instruments, but they're actually um, instruments that talk back to the satellite. Um, all these different ways um, and people using different back like their different backgrounds in chemistry or um, being meteorologists or, you know, being biologists are helping us really understand what's going on with the ice and um, what in its future. I also do want to point out that sea ice does make fun sounds. Um, if you take a ice core, um, like what Lisa and Evgeny are doing in the right hand top corner, um, when you pull this ice core out, a cylindrical piece of ice that they uh, essentially take um, from the surface to the bottom, as you take it out, it sounds like Rice Krispie treats or like Pop Rocks or something. And that's because um, there's brine channels in there where creature, little tiny creatures are living um, and they're just, they're emptying with the salt water out of there. So. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I have uh, just a couple other things to add about how sea ice was studied in the Weddell Sea. Um, we used some, uh, the sea ice team deployed a tracking buoy to help us better understand over the period of time we were there, how the sea ice moves. Um, and it was very surprising actually, um, surprising to me, maybe not surprising to them, but the sea ice moves in all different directions at different speeds. It does some loops, it shoots off in one direction, it goes another direction. 
it was very, um, to my mind, um, unpredictable where it would go, except for the fact that it's generally tied to the weather. Um, and those sorts of observations help us predict where sea ice might go without us being on the sea ice itself or for future navigation of these regions, um, where to expect there to be sea ice or, or generally um, how, how to navigate those regions better. Um, I know that some teams on the sea ice were looking at the internal ice structure of the, of the sea ice, like Leanna was saying, looking at snow and ice samples that they collected. Uh, by the time we, we got off the ship in Cape Town, we had just bins full of, of ice core samples that were all going back to a lab uh, to be looked at more closely. And that was a very exciting source of ongoing data and exploration that the team was, was going to be looking at. Um, and so th there's lots of ways to study sea ice. Um, I think Leanna's pictures tell the story really beautifully that there, you, you can look at and investigate lots of different ways and each way tells us something a little bit different. All right, now we get to sum it all up in some, <laughs> some big, big, beautiful bow, the legacy of polar exploration. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that we're, We've taken a lot of time here for sure and want to get to questions here. So I guess my takeaway thinking about Earth Week or Earth Day and, you know, for polar research scientists, people in natural sciences, right? Every day is Earth Day, right? Because um, it's people that drive science. Uh, it's people who have passion that drive these scientific expeditions that have the motivation and resilience to be there and to do it. And it's because of their incredible work, we're able to understand these regions a lot better, which will help us understand the Arctic's future and our Earth's future, and maybe help us with some policy work in the future, just fingers crossed, so. Absolutely, just to underline what Leanna said, the women and men who spend their careers um, in these remote regions collecting this data so that we can better understand our polar regions and the impact uh, that they have on our world are doing amazing work. Uh, they're an inspiration to me. And um, I'm really, again, happy that we got to share a little bit of what they're doing in these remote regions, because without events like this, uh, you know, it's hard to connect with people who are so far away, but doing important work. Um, the In terms of the legacy of polar exploration and the um, the inspiration provided by Nansen and Shackleton and other explorers of that era who had a very curious approach to the world um, that they wanted to learn as much as they could. Uh, they wanted to go places people hadn't been before and better understand the forces that were driving them. Um, for me, is just as relevant today as it was over 100 years ago, is the same spirit that drives expeditions like Mosaic and the Endurance 22 expedition, uh, learning more about our world, discovering um, things, asking questions, uh, finding answers sometimes. Sometimes when you go searching for answers, uh, you just come back with more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's the process of being curious about our world that will help us really better understand it and in the end protect it, um, these places that are so important. So with that, I think we have one final slide. And if you are, are participating in the chat today, if you have been listening really closely, I, I want you to guess whether this picture was taken in the Weddell Sea or uh, the Arctic. I'm not gonna tell you who took it because it would probably give it away, um, but there's, there's a definite clue here that will tell you whether this is from the Arctic or the Weddell Sea and the Antarctic. Uh, but with that, thank you so much for uh, for listening. And Leanna and I would love to answer any questions. All right, we're going to take some questions. If anyone wants to drop in the comments where you think this is, we would love to to hear your guesses. Um, <clears throat> Our first question is from Barb, who's joining us from Allen, Texas today. And she asked a couple questions. The first one is, what lessons did the leaders uh, of the Fram expedition take from USS uh, you, Janet expedition in 1878 and planning their voyage? Leanna, do you know if there was some inspiration from there? 
Um, you know, to be quite honest, I have only brushed up on really Nansen's uh, historic expeditions as um, I was really focused on the photography and documentary of modern day stuff. But I'm sure that a lot of polar researchers, um, you know, they did uh, heed lessons from each other, whether it was, um, you know, actually doing trading with indigenous communities for actual polar equipment, like they would take parkas that were made from like harp seal skins and like actually be able to communicate where you can go to those trading posts. Um, things like the engineering of ships and stuff like that, understanding that the ice pressure can indeed crush and actually sink a ship. Um, these are all lessons that as scientific exploration and discovery was happening out there, um, a lot of people actually, um, you know, they, they learned. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the Endurance and the Jeanette suffered the same fate and Nansen managed to avoid it. So I, I imagine yeah. he, he did learn a, a very critical lesson. <laughs> yes, I mean, he took quite a few years to actually um, make sure that the ship could withstand pressure. So um, I'm sure that was definitely a lesson learned from the previous Jeanette, uh, USS Jeanette. <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much, both of you. Um, all right, a question from Stormgrove Middle School who's joining us today. They have two questions. I'm going to ask um, both since I think their students are hanging back a little bit to hear your answers. Um, so the two questions, the first one is, what is the average thickness of the sea ice? Yeah, so that depends on where you are and what season it is. Um, we had sea ice that would range from like one to two meters so three to six feet or even eight feet if there was ridging which is essentially when sea ice goes on top of each other and makes little tiny mountains um this ice thickness has changed over time and it gets a lot thinner as melt season so when it's summer and you know there's sunlight all year um occurs so um the thinnest ice that i've been able to walk on though if I know it's not average, but is 26 centimeters. So that's that's fun. But <laughs> All right. Yeah. And it's very similar to Leanna. The average ice thickness on the ice flows we were investigating were one to two meters, which is considered first year ice. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the science team at one point took a helicopter deeper into the Weddell Sea to investigate a multi-year ice flow, which they were very excited about and spent all day investigating. But um, it was in, in the region of the Weddell Sea that we were investigating um, just recently, just this last February. Um, it was considered a pretty light ice year um, for that region of the Weddell Sea. And another question, thank you so much, that's great. Um, another question from Storm Grove Middle School, is there a police or security system in Antarctica? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I would imagine individual research bases have their own sort of um, guidelines for behaving well and getting along, especially when they're so far away from um, everybody else. It's hard when you're not, when you haven't been to um, an area like the Antarctic continent to understand even how far away these research bases are from each other and how difficult it is to get from base to base. When you are on a base, generally speaking, you are very isolated from the rest of the world. So the people who work there um, are, and I've met just a few of them and some who are going soon, um, that they are, are very um, professional scientists who go out of their way to get along really well with everybody because you're living in close quarters with other people. And it's really the same as living on a ship um, mm -hmm. where there's nowhere you can go if you're, if you're not, uh, you know, getting along with other people. So generally speaking, um, everybody works really hard to get along and cooperate because everyone who's there is generally very passionate about the experience of being there. Also, there are institutions that have very specific rules and um, a code of conduct that you do have to sign before going on a lot of these expeditions. And if you're in international waters, you are under seafaring laws. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's when uh, if you do a really bad thing, you know, then you could actually be put in jail by your captain or something. But that's only if you're very, very bad or something like that. <laughs> it's, no, it's a great point, Leanne, because most, most big expeditions need a permit of some kind in order to mm -hmm. conduct their work. And there are lots of guidelines, for example, about not interacting with the wildlife, 
avoiding them at all costs, sort of what scientific samples you can and can't collect and how many and really minimizing your impact on the environment uh, as part of your work. So in that sense, it is a, a supervisory or, or police organization protecting the health of these environments. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Storm. Those are great. Storm Grove, those are great questions. Um, we're going to take another question from Christina, who is joining us from Brooklyn. Um, and she had a couple questions here. One of them was, um, Tim, would you want to go to the Arctic next? And Leanna, do you want to go to Antarctica next? Have you, have you been to the opposite poles? <laughs> um, ahead, I've been. Antarctica before um, years ago, and it was amazing. And I would love to go back, <laughs> especially I was a beginning photographer back then. So mm -hmm. now that I have the principles um, that I love or that have made my work a lot better, um, I would love to go back and I would love to go back supporting more research scientists. Um, that's like where I find my work to be most fulfilling and helpful um, when we think about polar science. Yeah, I think my recent experiences in the Weddell Sea, even though I didn't get to touch foot on the Antarctic uh, continent, um, helped me understand the region enough to know that there's so much more to explore. It's such a dramatic and, and dynamic mm -hmm. place. And there, are, while I saw and did a lot of things, there's so much more to do. And I, hearing Leanna speak about the Arctic and learning more about the Mosaic expedition um, from members of that expedition has inspired me someday to go to the, the Arctic as well, uh, especially uh, would be amazing to see a polar bear. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions here about equipment. So um, two separate questions, but I'll ask them together. Um, wondering about if scuba divers were used. This is um, Barb asking and Rumo from Brazil would like to know if drones uh, for filming were used. So what kind of equipment were you using out there to um, study and document this? Great, so um, there can be scuba divers. We just didn't have them because that means more insurance. <laughs> That's like a big logistical thing. And it's a lot more logistics. So like making sure that you have the right equipment to house air for people, making sure that you have the proper search and rescue protocols that are gonna be in place for people because diving below the ice can be incredibly risky. And I know Antarctica does um, also scuba diving. Um, stuff down there too. I have a friend that just made a really cool documentary about it. I'm forgetting the name, but it's, um, her name is Rachel Heckman and she, she was there and made something, uh, a passion project. But um, as for drones, yes, we use drones for filming and for science. Um, we had at least uh, six um, airborne instruments that were going on on the Mosaic Expedition ice flow. And we did have a couple people that did some beautiful drone work, um, some that you can actually see in the uh, Mosaic Planetarium film that we have, as well as some of our documentaries made by um, the UFA team. That was the German uh, filmmaking team that was out there. Excellent. Yeah. And um, as part of the Endurance 22 expedition, we did have someone prepared to dive. Um, not, not, um, not recreationally. It was sort of a backup plan in case the, the AUV or the underwater robotics um, that we were using got trapped under the ice and needed a little help coming out. Um, it was way too deep there to like investigate the bottom by diving, but he had the equipment, he had a dry suit, and I think he was a little disappointed that he didn't get to use it because uh, it's a pretty unique place to dive. Um, as for drones, absolutely, yes, as part of the filmmaking, um, the documentary that's going to come out this fall about the, our expedition, um, lots of beautiful drone shots um, flown by, by very talented camera folks. And basically the, the um, machine or the technology that was used to find endurance in the first place was one of the most state-of-the-art complex drones, uh, underwater drones that I've ever seen. And I could talk for an hour about it. Um, <laughs> and we haven't had the person who, who operated the undersea AUVs for Mosaic for at least one leg also on Endurance 22. So we had lots of uh, great conversations about the use of drones and underwater robotics um, in these areas because it's so hard and risky, like Leanna said, to put people under the ice. Mm 
Wow, it's really incredible all the equipment that we're taking to these polar regions and um, the variety of tools that we use to study these places. Um, there is one more question from Storm Grove Middle School, and that was how far below the surface was the ship? Mm, the endurance ship. Um, it was 10,000 feet, just a little bit less than 10,000 feet. So about two miles um, if you went straight down. So you can see why someone in a scuba tank could not go down that far. It would have been very cold and very dark. Um, but the, the marine robotics handled that with no problem. Um, when you get down that deep as well, there's a lot of pressure. Um, it's like two miles of water standing on top of you. So even the marine robotics um, team had lots of backup pieces in case something sort of broke or needed to be mm -hmm. fixed um, in case um, the pressure got to it. Wow, that's really deep. Yeah, way deeper than the Arctic, like twice as deep than the Arctic, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it is It is a whole separate thing about um, polar exploration when you look at what's living and what's happening beneath the ice. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, marine biologists uh, were, and biologists were a part of the mosaic expedition looking at what was living underneath the ice. We did not have a marine biologist aboard uh, the Endurance 22 expedition, but I know there's been a lot of interest on the, the crazy living things that made the wreck of the endurance their home. And that will be studied for many years to come, I'm sure. So the undersea, we didn't even touch on the under under sea ice scene in the polar regions, but uh, also very fascinating work being done there. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's uh, This was great. It was really interesting to learn about the difference between the expeditions and the historic expeditions that inspired these, um, these two journeys. And this sounds like it's the beginning of, or, or the continuation of a, a long history of Arctic research. Um, and I look forward to, to learning more and continuing to follow along with these journeys. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today on... Uh, on Earth Week. You can see some of the historic expeditions in a VR tour if you're interested. There was a question about where to see the films. Um, and here is a link to uh, the documentaries that were created around Mosaic. Um, and I added that to the comments here um, for uh, you to explore. There's more curriculum on uh, our Mosaic website as well as on the Endurance uh, Reach the World website. So please feel free to, um, to explore some of this content. Excellent. If you're looking for more inspiring drone shots of polar regions, uh, the Endurance 22 Expedition documentary will be out this fall um, and I believe will be on Disney Plus. Awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> If you're anywhere near Boulder and you'd like to visit the Fisk Planetarium, both of the mosaic documentaries are playing at, uh, actively playing at Fisk. So that's another opportunity to see those. They're, they're on YouTube as well, if you'd like to watch it at home. Yeah, they're all accessible. So. Great, well, thanks, Leanna, that was fun. Yeah, thanks, Tim. It was such a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Daniela. Bye, everyone, thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming.